When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Thomas Jefferson. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today, we open a new chapter in American history. The 19th century will bring the United States prosperity, division, and then civil war. We'll see slavery meet its overdue end, but a new era of racial prejudice will take its place. By the end of the 1800s, America will have secured her place as a global power. But at the century's beginning, she was anything but. Thomas Jefferson won the presidential election of 1800, ousting John Adams after only one term. Indeed, Adams' presidency was blemished. His troubles with France, highlighted by the XYZ affair and resulting quasi-war, dominated the headlines. He faced criticism for the Alien and Sedition Act, which restricted due process for immigrants and hampered freedom of speech for all Americans. The size of the United States Army increased under Adams, evoking bad memories of British misrule, and the whiskey tax that had begun under the Washington administration continued to hurt farmers in the West. Presidential electors voted decisively to replace Adams with Thomas Jefferson, the first Democratic Republican president in the country's history. Jefferson's presidency and its aftermath is the subject of today's lecture. But first, let's ask a big question. How Jeffersonian was President Jefferson? Thomas Jefferson had long been a leading voice for limiting the federal government's power and preserving liberty for the states and people. He resigned from Washington's cabinet in part as a protest of the federal government's growth in 1793. He undercut the Adams administration by authoring the Kentucky Resolution in 1798, and he accused the Federalist Party of driving the nation towards tyranny when he ran against Adams in 1800. But upon taking office in 1801, Jefferson found himself in a compromising and somewhat ironic position. He had made his name in American politics as a critic of the federal government, but now found himself at the head of that very institution. Upholding the Jeffersonian ideals that he had long espoused would therefore require him to undercut his own authority. So, did Thomas Jefferson stay true to his ideology and reduce the size and scope of the federal apparatus? Or did he succumb to the temptation to exercise the power that was bestowed to him by his predecessors? Let's find out. Our first big idea outlines the ways in which Jefferson upheld Jeffersonian Republican principles. The goal of Jeffersonian democracy was to focus on the common man and return the United States to the ideals of the American Revolution. As president, Jefferson attempted to walk back the scope and size of the federal government. Jefferson's vision for America was to build a self-sufficient agrarian society, one reliant not on bankers or merchants, but independent and industrious yeoman farmers. He believed that the expansion of the federal government during the Washington and Adams administration had undermined this vision. He therefore sought to undo much of the work of his predecessors in hopes of lessening the burden on the common man and restoring liberty to the people. He eliminated dozens of jobs in the federal government and fired every single tax collector on the federal payroll. He eliminated the whiskey tax that had begun during the Washington administration, as well as other taxes on unfree labor and real estate. He reduced the size of the army, which had expanded under Adams, and he permitted the controversial Alien and Sedition Act to expire without a replacement. Jefferson slashed the federal budget and began paying down the national debt, which, remember, was a key part of Hamilton's financial plan. Indeed, on first look, it seems that Jefferson stayed true to his long-held ideology. But a few enormously consequential decisions call into question his legacy as a true Jeffersonian president. This is our second big idea. The Louisiana Purchase and Embargo of 1807 represent expansions in federal power, in opposition to Jefferson's long-held principles. Not every one of Jefferson's actions as president served the small government agenda. He retained the Bank of the United States, despite the fact that he had once argued it was unconstitutional. And he exercised power as commander-in-chief in an undeclared naval conflict with Barbary pirates in Tripoli. In at least two other instances, he actually increased the power and presence of the federal government. 
At the turn of the 19th century, the Louisiana Territory commanded much American attention. Back in 1763, Spain had assumed control of Louisiana as part of the Treaty of Paris. This was favorable to the United States. Spain's global empire was in decline, and they managed the territory from afar. During Washington's presidency, the United States established friendly relations with Spain with Pinckney's Treaty, which granted the United States free navigation of the Mississippi River and use of the Port of New Orleans. New Orleans was by far the most important city of the whole Louisiana Territory. It was the busiest port of the Gulf South and the gateway to the Mississippi River, a proverbial superhighway for early trade. But in 1800, Napoleon regained Louisiana for France. This made the United States a little uneasy for several reasons. While relations with the Spanish were amicable, French relations had deteriorated in recent years, especially since the XYZ affair and quasi-war. Furthermore, Napoleon was proving himself a formidable and unpredictable force in Europe. The United States grew nervous about sharing a border with a rising European dictator with imperial ambitions. So Thomas Jefferson sent negotiators to France with $10 million to try to purchase the port of New Orleans from Napoleon. Now, it's worth taking a look at this proposal from Napoleon's perspective. The Frenchman was preparing for more wars and needed cash, lots of it. But Napoleon's focus was on Europe, and France's North American colonies were not doing well. A slave uprising had recently overthrown French control in Haiti, and Napoleon knew that maintaining Louisiana would be expensive. So he countered Jefferson's proposal by offering the entire Louisiana Territory for $15 million. The purchase price came out to only 3.5 cents per acre, a bargain even by 19th century standards. But the offer posed an ideological quandary for Jefferson. Jefferson was a strict constructionist who believed that the government's authority was limited to those powers explicitly spelled out in the Constitution. And the Constitution says nothing of a president's ability to purchase land. Despite this, Jefferson accepted Napoleon's offer and doubled the size of the United States. By doing so, he also expanded the authority of the federal government by setting a new precedent for presidential power. The Louisiana Purchase set the stage for decades of westward expansion and historians generally agree that it was the right move for the future prosperity of the United States. But it was not without its repercussions. Specifically, American relations with Great Britain took a hit as a result of Jefferson's actions. After the Louisiana Purchase, Napoleon, now flush with cash, ramped up his war machine, and fighting broke out yet again between France and Britain. Britain blamed the United States for this, since Jefferson had essentially funded the army of their enemy. To make matters worse, Britain struggled to keep its navy staffed during the Napoleonic Wars. Many British sailors were defecting from the ranks and escaping to the United States in order to avoid the war. Desperate for sailors, Britain began a policy known as impressment. Through impressment, the British attempted to reclaim their sailors, often pulling them from American ships on the high seas. Unfortunately, this process was carried out sloppily, and some of the sailors forced into service were actually American citizens who had never been a part of the British Navy. As you can imagine, this sparked outrage in the United States. Americans were furious about their sons, fathers, and brothers being kidnapped by the British and forced to fight in a foreign war. Things grew tense with Britain, but Jefferson, like his predecessors, endeavored to avoid a shooting war with Europe. He warned the British against further impressment, but the practice continued. So Jefferson turned to economic measures. In 1807, his administration passed the Embargo Act, which halted all overseas trade in the United States. His goal was to hurt Britain's economy by eliminating its trade with the US, but the plan backfired in a big way. Jefferson had overestimated Britain's reliance on trade with America and underestimated the reliance of the United States on foreign trade. The embargo flung the US into an economic depression one that hit the Northeast especially hard. Free trade had long been a pillar of the Democratic Republican platform, so even members of Jefferson's own party were critical of the policy. The embargo also represented another expansion of the federal government, a government which was now telling American merchants who they could and could not do business with. Without question, 
The embargo was the most damaging policy of Jefferson's presidency, and it tainted an otherwise successful tenure as president. Honoring the precedent established by George Washington, Jefferson retired after his second term. He lobbied for James Madison to take up the Democratic-Republican banner, and Madison won the presidency decisively in 1808, thanks in part to the conspicuous absence of Federalist leadership. 22 years after the Constitution was written, its chief author became the President of the United States. Madison inherited a troubled U.S. economy and a deteriorating relationship with Great Britain. During his tenure, Madison will see that relationship devolve into war, but the conclusion of that war will usher in a period of growth, patriotism, and stability. But that will be the subject of our next lecture. So, all in all, how Jeffersonian was President Jefferson? His reduction to the size and scope of the federal government are certainly noteworthy. He reduced the tax burden on the common man and helped to restore liberties that were threatened during the Federalist administrations that came before him. On the other hand, his expansion of the power and presence of the federal government with the Louisiana Purchase and the Embargo Act seemed to fly in the face of traditional Jeffersonian principles. We should note, however, that even in these instances, Jefferson's actions were consistent with his ultimate vision for the country. Sure, the Louisiana Purchase expanded the power of the executive branch, but by doubling the size of the United States, Jefferson unlocked incredible agricultural potential, pushing America towards the agrarian model that he had always envisioned. The Embargo Act limited Americans' economic freedom, but Jefferson hoped that it would foster self-sustainability and decrease foreign entanglements, which he had also always advocated. Perhaps the presidencies of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson teach us a broader lesson about politics and ideology. Both men were philosophical giants of their day. They were undeniably brilliant thinkers whose ideas formed the ideological foundation for the United States. But neither Adams nor Jefferson were overwhelmingly successful as presidents. They both learned the hard way that successful governance sometimes requires a departure from firmly held ideological beliefs. Indeed, we will see throughout the course of American history that some of our most ideological presidents have struggled to find balance between their principles and the realities of democratic policymaking. Striking the right balance may in fact be the key to successful leadership in this model. Next time, we'll discuss an emerging sense of nationalism in America, one bolstered by a maturing economy and the emergence of the United States onto the world stage. See you then.